Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. First, I'd like to thank EFF, Mercatus, the App Developers Alliance, Public Knowledge, and Generation Opportunity for organizing. With the Senate Judiciary Committee taking up legislation this week to combat abusive patent litigation, it's imperative that lawmakers strike the right balance with a comprehensive reform package. There's a, light to, there's a lot to like about the main bill under consideration in the Senate, introduced by Patrick Leahy and co-sponsored by Mike Lee. The bill follows the path of the Innovation Act, which passed in the House in December by an overwhelming margin. Like the House bill, which has the support of the White House, it tackles a set of important litigation reforms, as well as addressing demand letters and transparency requirements for patent litigation and ownership. Related proposals from Senators Cornyn, Schumer, and Hatch also offer language that will be up for consideration this week. This is also an issue that disproportionately affects millennials, who are simultaneously more tech-savvy and more entrepreneurial than older generations. With abusive litigation from certain patent assertion entities, or patent trolls, costing the innovation economy tens of billions each year, it's clear that now is the time for reform. Now I'd like to move the panel over to our group of policy scholars, innovators, and entrepreneurs to kick off the discussion with a question, why should millennials care about patent trolls, and what are the interests they have at stake in this debate? Luke, will you take off from here? Sure, yeah, so um, just so, first of all, the gen op, um, we, we identify millennials, engage, and mobilize them uh, to promote economic uh, freedom. And as part of that, we also give voice to Congress on these issues. I kind of see us as sort of a trade association for millennials. You know, uh, Congress didn't really care about Mark Zuckerberg until he was a billionaire, uh, but, you know, he created Facebook when he was 24. So in reality, Congress needs to see the issues of the young entrepreneur, and in, in our age, we're the most tech-savvy, entrepreneurial, creative uh, generation uh, America has. And so with patent issues, when you're uh, bogged down in, in uh, litigation and you can't even afford to start your business, uh, that becomes an issue for a generation that has 15.8% unemployment uh, and it has an insane amount of student loan debt. So we see this as a, a paramount issue for millennials and, quite frankly, the future of our economy. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Hey, Zach, I'll, I'll chime in here a little bit. Um, and th thanks, Zach, for you know taking the lead in organizing this. Um, this is a this is a really great panel and a really great discussion that we're having. Um, you know, so as as um, public knowledge, we represent some some of the consumer interests um, that are at play in. Um, in the patent debate, and I think as um, as Luke just highlighted, you know, a lot of the technologies that consumers use, like uh, mobile phones, mobile apps, um, you know, computer technology, a lot of these are are really the ones that are at stake um, when we're talking about um, patent trolls and the patent and the patent debate. Um, to the extent that these sorts of technologies are inhibited, um, especially the sorts of small businesses that really are the wellspring of a lot of technical development these days. Um, to the extent that patents are inhibiting those, they're inhibiting consumers' choice, to, um, choice of technology, inhibiting consumers' access to, to technology, inhibiting the, the promise of consumers to create new technologies and to contribute to this economy. So that's why, that's why you know, we believe uh, patent reform is really essential, not just to the business community, but also to the consumers in general and to the public. Now, it's been discussed that the current reforms to uh, civil lit litigation being considered in the Senate and that have already passed in the House will uh, reduce costs overall for both plaintiffs and defendants uh, in patent suits, particularly um, that it may have a benefit for legitimate plaintiffs. Uh, is that something Charles or others have opinions on? Hi, Isaac. Um, sorry about that. I just had to get something. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, the litigation the litigation matters are incredibly important. They they are the matter of discussion um, in in the Senate right now. Um, you know, most of the negotiations over the, the appearance of the final form of the bill um, are centering around particularly you know the issues of fee shifting and um, of discovery. And you know, well, the perspective I have is that I used to I used to work as a patent attorney, and you know, a lot of the things that we talk about theoretically, I've actually experienced firsthand. Um, 
litigation is very expensive. Uh, litigation is expensive, you know, just because of litigation, but litigation is also expensive because people have learned how to take advantage of patent, of patent lawsuits in order to make them not about the merits of the case, not about innovation, but really about who can pay more. And, you know, for big companies, that's a cost of doing business. For small companies, that's life or death. Right, and so when you have small companies who can't even afford to get into the door, you know, that and you know they all they all they can do is they can pay a settlement um, in order to hope that the suit goes away. You know, that's that's something that really impacts um, some of the most important innovators today. Now, a lot of startups uh, are also in the position of needing to secure funding, uh, which may be secured with in their intellectual property that they can get. Um, now. From what we see, uh, you know, do people think that legitimate intellectual property holders have anything to worry about with the current reforms under consideration? I'll, I'll type in. Uh, um, not quite. I mean, um, so when you when you look at the language of the bill, it, it's actually or uh, of the proposal language um, for for many of the bills, it's actually pretty. Um, clear that if you have a legitimate um, patent, and I'm saying legitimate patent in the sense that it is something that is not um, uh, the the quality of the patents that we've seen um, being asserted, um, you you probably have nothing to worry about. Um, you know the 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 bills do actually a very good job of of being crafted to um, target patent trolls and uh, target these bad actors while. Um, still allowing for startups to um, have patents if they if they want. Now, uh, you know, it's it's something that has been discussed uh, both by people at EFF and at Mercatus that uh, you know a lot of the troll lawsuits are based on software related patents or business method patents, things that have only been patentable material in the last couple of decades. That is certainly a lot of controversy over whether these things should even be patentable. There's uh, a case in the Supreme Court right now that's weighing in on software patents in particular. Certainly, uh, there was a GAO study that said these types of patents are largely responsible for the increase in troll lawsuits. Uh, Eli, I was hoping you could weigh in further on this issue of patent quality and why it's important. Sure. Um, well, first of all, the, the big issue uh, that people don't realize is that the number of patents that we have uh, granted in recent years has just grown tremendously. Um, it, it's quadrupled since the early 1980s. Uh, and, and a lot of those, as you say, are software patents. Uh, about half of all the patents that we grant right now are software patents. And it's really interesting because the Supreme Court has already ruled three times that you can't have a pure software patent. So we're granting patents that have been uh, disallowed by the Supreme Court three different times. Uh, and so basically what has happened is that through other court decisions, the, that Supreme Court precedent has been eroded. Uh, and now we have uh, half of our, our patents are that are being granted are software patents. And software patents are uh, bad for, uh, I think, two reasons. Um, so one is that they have very uh, fuzzy boundaries and uh, it's very hard to know when, when you're independently inventing something whether you're infringing on somebody else. And then the other reason I think that they're, they're particularly harmful is that they're often an input into a, a bigger product. So something like a smartphone uses thousands of uh, software patents uh, in its creation. So um, that, that dynamic of you, you have to license just thousands of patents in order to get your one product off the ground. It's not one product and one patent. It's thousands of patents and one product. It means that you have to have a huge legal department uh, in order to comply with, uh, with all, the, all the rules. So I think, uh, I think that that's actually the root cause of all the trolling problems is just the sheer, sheer volume of patents, the, the, the fact that it's, it's particularly egregious uh, kinds of uh, subject matter, uh, software patents are four times more likely to be litigated than, say, like a chemical patent for a pharmaceutical. Um, and then, of course, the court system has really, uh, you know, other than the Supreme Court, uh, the, the Federal Circuit Court, which hears all the patent appeals, has uh, really undermined Supreme Court precedent that was actually good law. 
So you say that's a, a huge barrier to entry for, for young entrepreneurs or people working in that space. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so if you think about something like, like the smartphone industry, there's no way, there's no reason that you should necessarily have to be a big company to produce a smartphone, right? We see in other, uh, you know, electronics, uh, we see lots of innovation from small players. Uh, but right now we have just a handful of, of uh, smartphone companies, and they're because, it's because they can navigate these legal patent thickets uh, well enough to, to get their, uh, their product out to the market. There certainly seem to be a lot of low-quality patents in this area, even ones in the design patent space the, with the famous lawsuit between Samsung and Apple over things like rounded buttons and slide to unlock and things that, you know, seem very suspect in terms of whether they should be patentable or not. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it, it's really just an out-of-control system, and it's, it's that fundamental uh, aspect, the, the patent quality thing, that I think is driving all of the trolling. And I think, uh, if I may, uh, you know, Eli's hitting the, the nail on the head here. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion now has been around patent trolls because that's the most obvious issue. Um, however, uh, you know, I, we, we agree with Eli that uh, the fundamental issue are these vague, overbroad, uh, generally software-related patents, uh, and we'd love to see um, uh, this discussion around patent quality enter, or I guess re-enter, the, um, the lawmaking discussion. Um, you know, we had uh, Senator Schumer's proposal about the covered business method review. Um, however, that's out of the picture now. Uh, it'd be nice for uh, patent quality to enter the picture again because this is the fundamental cause of many of these issues. If I, if I can just add kind of one more point to both of these very good points about patent quality. Um, you know, I think one of the things we've discovered in the, you know, in the last, the last few years is that, you know, the Supreme Court lays out this precedent um, that, explains, that explains their views on software patents, but, um, you know, patent lawyers who are acquiring patents are, are you know, they're very, they're very clever, right? They figure out ways around these sorts of rules. Um, they figure out ways to make patents that that you know are on very simple subject matter look like they're about very complicated things. So the case that's before the Supreme Court, the Alice versus CLS Bank case um, that everybody has been talking about, um, that patent, um, you know, it covers a very basic method of of dealing with financial transactions, um, but it uses some some 500 words in order to describe the the basics of that transaction. And as a result, a lot of the courts looking at it, they see this very long patent description. I think the description is about 100 pages long. Um, it uses very technical terms, and it sounds like it's something a lot more than it is. Um, and when you actually boil it down, it turns out, you know, as we showed in our amicus brief, that this is nothing more than seven lines of very simple computer code. Um, a lot of these patents turn out this way, and I think it tells us two things. Number one is the fact that we really need to start analyzing these patents for what they are and not what you know, people have to complicate them to look like. And number two, we need a lot more enforcement of you know, the sort of vague, complicated language. Because the way the system is set up right now, the more vague and the more complex a patent is, the more the lawyers are going to have to spend on figuring out what it means, the more the company is going to have to defer their product development in favor of patent litigation, and the less innovation we have. So as a result, you know, looking at these sorts of issues of patent quality, patent vagueness, um, are really important, not just to kind of the overall theory of patents, but also to the very economy that creates innovation. Now, I should just add in here that this is this this problem of vagueness is also a problem with the the way the civil litigation system works. All of the incentives right now seem like they're aligned to for for a patent owner to make their claim as broad and as expansive as possible. Yeah, that, and I would add to this uh, beyond kind of the the patent structure. Um, let's not let's not get away from the fact that patent trolls are preying on vulnerable people. It's it's people. It's aftermarket. It's, it's a coffee shop that has a Wi-Fi system. They have no idea, no connection to the Wi-Fi, the, the uh, patent whatsoever. Um, in, in fact, a Georgetown Law Study shows that over 50% of the uh, cases are uh, the trolls are attacking uh, small businesses, $10 million value or less. Uh, and when with a, a company going to trial. Uh, a small company taking $2 million to go through full trial. That's 20% or greater of their total value. They're taking advantage of a small business that doesn't understand it. So the, the discussion of the complexity of the patent and the broadness of the patent 
it, yeah, sure, there, there may be a big issue, but right now, uh, it's, it's just a matter of um, them allowing anyone to just outsue anybody with less money and less resources. Uh, and that's, that's reality. And, and they are a little timid because the same study shows that 90% of the time, if the company does go through a full trial, that uh, a company wins 90% of the time. That means less than 10% of the time a patent troll uh, actually has a legitimate uh, case. And further, you know, going into that issue a little more deeply, the majority of the patent troll lawsuits are over software-related or business method patents. And there was a GMU study, I recall, and Eli, you may be familiar with this, that showed that over 50% of those would be found invalid if actually challenged all the way through court. Um, but right now I'd like to move to our innovators and entrepreneurs on the panel and give them some time. Um, Danny Siegel, uh, are you ready to jump in and tell us a little bit about your experience? Yes, more than happy to. Um, thank you for arranging this. It's been a great panel so far. Um, Find the Best, we're an online comparison engine. We help 20 million consumers a month make a decision on a variety of purchase topics. And uh, we were sued uh, back in June for what has now been called the matchmaking patent, uh, which we invalidated. Um, to Paul's point um, earlier about patents sounding very um, complicated, when you get this patent, it sounded very, very complicated. This multilateral decision making, storing data by asking people questions, and having to run an analysis to match them up. Um, we went and prosecuted the patent after 20 other companies had licensed it because uh, they didn't want to go through litigation. Um, which goes to the other point that was mentioned earlier, how most of these cases either are settled because that's cheaper or because um, uh, you just don't have the money to fight. Um, but when you do fight, you actually win like we did. Uh, and the judge, as Paul said, was able to boil it down to the essence of the patent, that they were literally trying to patent the idea of matchmaking, that the whole concept of surveying people to ask questions and then match them up on their preferences, that was somehow a novel and patentable idea. Um, and so luckily the judge ruled on that, and uh, we won in uh, early motion judgment for uh, invalidating the patent. And uh, now we also have a RICO case going on against the uh, plaintiff, um, suing them for uh, civil RICO, for uh, their uh, means by which they go through this. It's a very unjust way whereby basically we had criminal threats against us, um, extortion can you, can you tell us a little more about what a RICO suit is in case people in our audience aren't familiar? Yeah, RICO is a racketeering uh, charges. It's similar to what a uh, mafia typically is where you usually see it. Um, it basically gets to the heart of the, uh, the people playing behind the companies, not the companies themselves, so it's the actual individuals. Um, it's very hard to actually have a defensive move when you're being sued um, for patent charges because they're all um, shell companies that they hide behind. These are mostly lawyers that are designing these uh, shell companies, so they really know how to structure them properly. Um, and through a series of events whereby they uh, told us that calling them patent trolls publicly was a criminal offense of, of demeaning their character. They're going to sue us for criminal charges uh, and extorting us for uh, those charges. And we even, you know, it was very obvious to anyone that we didn't, A, not invalidate the patent. And this is probably one of the weakest patents ever granted by the USPTO in their wisdom. Um, they still tried to pressure us into uh, settling. Uh, so we uh, retaliated with uh, a RICO claim so that we could uh, have some type of defensive um, framework. Because right now, the patent legal system, there's really not much you can do when you're being sued um, in a patent suit. The burden of proof all falls on you. Um, and so it's very costly, very time consuming, uh, and very tiring to actually go through these uh, cases. It was a, quite the learning experience as a millennial myself to be hit with a lawsuit for the first time, no legal background. But a startup, you know, that all of a sudden falls on your plate because you don't have a chief legal officer. You can't afford one. And it's only a handful of, of groups that actually fight the, the troll infringement claims like you do, if I'm not mistaken. And many of those that do end up settling with the trolls and paying the nuisance settlement, which is cheaper than the millions that they'd have to pay in litigation costs, uh, you know, often have to sign NDAs and, you know, can't talk about it and can't, you know, tell their stories to us. So there's a potential for, you know, a vast amount of, of hidden costs here. Um, Charles or Adi or Eli, do you care to comment further on that point? I think it's a great point. Um, you know, uh, as uh, there, there was actually a House Commerce hearing on, on demand letters earlier today, and it kind of referred to um, how much of this is the is the hidden part of the iceberg. We kind of see 
um, some demand letters public. We see some of the uh, the trials that are public, but we never see the bulk of what's going on because it's uh, trolls sending demand letters and then settlements and then NDAs and silence. Um, we, we tried to uh, uh, go about this by creating a tool called Trolling Effects, um, EFF and PK and a bunch of other groups, uh, for people to put their demand letters online, um, which has worked out to, to varying levels of success. And if you go on the site, you can actually see what these demand letters look like. Um, that being said, there's still way too little transparency around this whole process. And um, even, even in this uh, demand letter process, there's a little transparency, so it's unclear what's being asserted, who owns what, and uh, what these companies can do about it. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly, there are a couple of proposals out there that deal with demand letters. And one of the strongest is from Senator McCaskill and has a quite controversial proposal to expand <coughs> FTC authority to deal with this under consumer protection. Uh, there's also a lot of stuff that's been happening in the states, uh, you know, led by Vermont and others to empower their attorney generals to go after people sending thousands of demand letters out on a single patent to just every, anyone and everyone, including the, the famous case of the, the, the patent troll suing people over having network scanners and the other suing people over having Wi-Fi in hotels or coffee shops. Um, so there's certainly a major problem there, and uh, you know it complicates matters when you think of you know when you have to balance the consumer protection side uh, against the free speech issue. Um, does anyone else have any further thoughts on that point? Yeah, the the one thing I would add is you know I think Zach you brought up a lot of the the very well known and you know um, noteworthy newsworthy patent trolls, um, but you know beyond that there's a whole industry of you know people who own a couple patents in, a, in you know a small subdivision of an industry, um, they often sue a lot of the the small emerging companies in that industry, and the fact of the matter is we're just never going to find out about them because they're not big enough to you know be on the headlines of the newspapers. Um, and that's why, you know, as Adi was mentioning, you know, a lot of the transparency issues are, are really not about these big, big patent trolls that everybody knows about. We're about kind of the smaller ones that, you know, we're not going to hear about but are harming the industry just the same or to a greater extent. And I know a lot of the stuff that's been happening in the states includes, you know, creating a database for people that assert you know, or to send a number of letters on a single patent or, or just sort of increasing, you know, the, the transparency there. Um, which are all sort of important and necessary reforms. Uh, now, go, let's move on to our next innovator. Uh, Danny uh, would, from Nutritionx, would you be ready to tell your story? Absolutely. And it's uh, rather similar to what Danny was mentioning of coming into uh, the world of being an entrepreneur and very quickly finding out that a law degree would have been extremely helpful in all the different steps that we didn't expect. Uh, we came out with the mission of trying to make nutrition information more transparent and available to consumers. And in this process, we built interactive nutrition tools to let customers uh, really know what they're eating, of customizing a meal to remove certain ingredients and have a better idea of uh, all of the, the side of what they're consuming. And in this process, we built a platform have over 60 different restaurant chains using our information. And while this process was going on, we started catching wind of this broad patent troll that was going around suing people for meal building. And it's really that piece that many of you touched upon of something so simple that shouldn't at all be patentable and something interesting that while we built this company, we never thought of even looking it up because adding and subtracting calories, really just addition, was something so simple that it, it wasn't anything logical for us. So once we started catching wind of this, we started paying more attention to uh, what these suits were looking like and how companies were settling and really encouraging the patent trolls to continue their practices because they are settling. I can't necessarily blame them because of the, the difference of cost that you all have mentioned as well, uh, but it's something that we noticed continues to perpetuate this problem. Uh, Specifically with Nutritionix, it's been difficult for us for our business where our clients or future clients are potentially afraid to sign on to use a tool which really just helps their customers uh, because of a fear of this looming patent troll that can't really find a, their own product to 
to uh, actually sell using their, their patent. It's solely for the purpose of reaching out and trying to tackle these small businesses that can't afford it themselves. And just to follow up with that point, um, this is an issue having a, a looming infringement claim against you for a small startup. It seems like it would make it very difficult to bring on investors or to expand your business beyond just the fact that you're spending all of your energy dealing with the lawsuit. Yes, uh, it is something that luckily due to our sales we've been able to run the company based on our own revenue. But it is something of concern that I can imagine an investor would be more concerned of investing in a company that could potentially be sued at any point. And it's one of those interesting pieces that we always debate internally. Of if we would have known how the patent system worked, especially in software, we never would have started a company in the first place. Uh, the amount that it's stunted our growth of what it could be uh, is really something that just illustrates how broken the system is of patents being there to protect innovators, but really all it's doing is keeping us afraid of growing anymore. I can speak to that. And having uh, just gone through a debt financing round and you have to disclose your ongoing litigation, even though we won, they still have the ability to appeal. And so when we were talking to the bankers, we had to actually show them all the uh, documents, explain to them the case, and it's it's not something you want to invest in. You don't want to invest in uh, litigation. It's, you know, it's under a lot of uncertainty, a lot of risk. Investors don't want that. And there's potentially huge costs. Um, so another thing you don't want to invest in as well. And then it just adds a lot of time and effort to go through that and see what the real risk is. And we're very unique where uh, our CEO actually decided to take on the litigation risk. So uh, the company is not on the line for it, which is something most companies do not have at their disposal. He decided it was the just thing to do. He did not want to have to do what the board wanted us to do, which was to settle, because that was a nice $50,000 check, and it was um, you know, swept away under the rug, and we wouldn't have to see them again. But then you have your target on your back. You're, you're known as a company that gives in. You're a company that settles. And we knew there'd only be more and more of these uh, su frivolous suits to come from. So uh, our CEO just pledged a million dollars to fight it and financed it himself. And still, when we're going through fin financing, to have to explain how that works and how he's actually paying for it and companies not on the line, it was still a, a, a difficult process. And Danny and Daniel, that was uh, fortunate for or Danny, that was fortunate for you. Daniel, to your point, it's the awareness. If you had had any idea that you would even go through this litigation issue, you may have not even started your company. Well, what a massive burden on on our generation entrepreneurs. The hardest thing is the one the free market's hard enough. It's hard enough to start a business on your own. Let alone let alone to see this possible issue that you're gonna have to take on these big patent trolls. It really is a big uh, barrier to entry, uh, and it, it's pretty bad. It, you really see a cronyism element to it. How easy it is easy it for anybody to uh, bring down a young uh, uh, startup uh, because they don't want them entering into their market. So I, I think even awareness is good. Uh, awareness of the patent troll issue is good, especially when we want to change legislation. And luckily, there are a few uh, uh, free forms available. But uh, like in, to a certain degree people being aware that they could be attacked could prevent people starting their business uh, and to begin with. So, and, ha and having this sort of massive systemic uncertainty for the, the, the new innovative sector of our economy, it's just not you know, a c circumstance that can continue to go on. We can't do business in the courtroom uh, where these, you know, ha and have these claims resolved there. It's, you know, I, I believe the number for bringing patent litigation all the way through trial is about $5 million and, you know, around $2 million even for small companies. So having all of these broad, overly broad patents out there that can be asserted against anyone and everyone uh, is, must be unsustainable. Um, Eli, do you have any thoughts to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're exactly right that, um, you know, I said earlier that the rate of, at which we're grant, granting patents has uh, has really increased, but we've just come also come off the slowest decade in terms of rate of growth of the economy uh, since the Great Depression. So, so our economy is growing more slowly uh, than ever, or than you know, in in recent memory. Um, at the same time, is that as we have. Um, 
just a huge increase in the number of patents. So I think that that right there is like evidence that patents do not automatically lead to, to growth and that they are, they, can, they are, in fact, a barrier to growth in a lot of cases. So it's at least circumstantial evidence. Absolutely. Uh, now I want to move over to Michael. Thanks, Zach. Um, just by way of background, I represent American Apparel and Footwear Association. So the rest of our esteemed panelists are representing, you know, high tech, software developers, consumer groups. So what does a T-shirt have to do with patent trolls? And I think just the fact that we are here is is proof of just how large this problem has gotten. You know, it's not they're not targeting just the you know the, the software industries or um, retail industries. They're targeting every possible person that they can they can go after. Um, and we've used the term uh, business method several times, uh, and I, I actually believe that that term doesn't necessarily describe um, what the issue we're dealing with, because a lot of these these patent trolls are targeting the actions of our everyday lives. You know, when you're talking about having a Wi-Fi at a Starbucks, you know, that's something that a lot of people rely on, a lot of people count on. When you look at you know um, emailing yourself a scanned document. That's not something that's just business method. That's something that people do in their homes. Even uh, shortening a URL, much like the one we sent out uh, for this hangout, you know, was once a target of a patent troll. So they're really, to kind of put it into perspective, it's not just about the businesses. It really is about everybody that uses technology. And apparel companies use technology. So you know, we've, we've really felt the strain um, and actually, to, to Danny's point that he mentioned earlier about getting the target on your back, that we have seen that as a real problem. There, we have several members that uh, dealing with these lawsuits has become a, a part of their you know, daily lives, where they expect to get four or five of them every year, and they are just planning on dealing with them. So it, it really has reached a, a, a point where companies and some of the larger companies, some of the smaller companies are not able to do that. They have two of these lawsuits and they're gone. Some of the larger companies are at least able to manage these, these lawsuits, but they're expecting it, which is a real problem when you're talking about uh, something that's supposed to promote innovation. Um, you shouldn't be planning to defend yourself. Uh, and another point to make is, you know, I represent a, a trade association, but in this aspect, you know, we're consumers. So, you know, you, you talk about the consumer industry groups, the, you, the business industry groups. You know, we're, we're both kind of on the, on the same side of, of the field when it comes to we're the ones that are, you know, buying this technology. When you talk about having a shopping cart on your website, that's something that's targeted. You know, they're not the ones that are they're purchasing these uh, inputs onto their websites or a store locator. You know, this is technology that, that our members are buying and then having to deal with the lawsuits. Um, and then one of the other points that I wanted to make, you know, I, I just, I find it an obligation to raise the awareness that this doesn't end with patents. The trolling practice goes on to all aspects of the IP world. So when you're talking about copyrights, you're talking about trademarks, you're still dealing with patent trolls. You know, our, our members deal with that every single day. Um, somebody owns a copyright for a zebra print pattern. Uh, and apparently it's not the zebras, because I'm pretty sure they come up with the first. But And just to in interject there, I've seen that there's a, a rise of design patents in your industry as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and a lot of them are people trying to protect their original designs, but with the, the success of patent trolls, you've seen a rise in generic... Um, so, like I said, zebra prints, also Hawaiian flower prints are a big target for, for copyright trolls, something that has existed for hundreds of years. Um, and a copyright, you know, is supposed to last for 70-some years. If a design has existed for more than, than 70, we've actually seen examples where our members were sued for a pattern that was found in a museum from a Victorian-era dress. So the dress has existed for several hundred years, but they tried to copyright the pattern, which is an illegal practice. So you're, you're seeing these easy targets expand because of the success of patent trolls into copyrights and into trademarks. And I think that's something that, that needs to be kept in mind when you, while we're dealing with the patent troll issue. Right. I mean, following up to that, 
you know, they've even tried to, you know, trademark or, or otherwise protect things as ridiculous as the, you know, color of the sole of a shoe or, uh, you know, just even basic designs that have been around forever. And the, you know, potential in infringement damages has gone way up, at least in the design patent space since the Egyptian goddess case in 2008. So, you know, we're seeing an explosion of a lot of overly broad intellectual property in a lot of different sectors. Absolutely. And, and to kind of add to that, um, you know, Eli uh, often brings up just the, the broadness of the patents, but I think Michael, Michael hits it or not that it's really, uh, there's an opportunity being seen here to take advantage of the people who don't know the system, period. It could be a legitimate patent or not, um, but in reality, like, let's talk about the, the reforms being offered. It's the cost, opportunity cost of a business to fight the patent troll or not. And it, it could be copyrights, it could be patents, software, whatever it is. It's the opportunity cost. So, uh, you know, um, saying that he may have not started uh, his, his company, had he known he'd go through what he did. But what if one of the reforms being fee shifting, where if you knew, if you went into it, that uh, if you won, that the patent troll ended up having to pay the cost of the court trial. That small reform is huge because it says, it says you can't intimidate people. They have a fighting chance in court. And when most of the time patent trolls lose anyways, it's a huge shift uh, uh, on the liability for a company to actually go into the case. You know, and, and with Danny, you mentioned that after you won, you still went to appeal. Uh, well, even in the appeal, if you know, they were less likely to go through that if they end up having to pay your court costs. So that's just one of the reforms. We, I don't think we've touched on some of the reforms that were here, but I think fee shifting is huge uh, in the, all these cases. And also in terms of just reducing costs across the board, a lot of the discovery reform proposals under consideration and that we're in, uh, Representative Goodlatte's uh, Innovation Act will do a lot just to bring that $5 million number down quite a lot. Um, now, Adi or Charles, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the the discovery proposal, simply to kind of put a little face on, on the numbers. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, I, I used to do this sort of thing, and one of the techniques that you see very often is that some is that you know the party on the other side will come will come to you and say hey you know I need to produce uh, 10 million 10 million pages of documents um, and you need to produce all of these within within a week well okay so what does what does that mean that means that I as the patent lawyer have to go through each of those 10 million pages of documents to make sure there's no privileged information to determine whether or not it's confidential to determine whether or not it's relevant in the first place a lot of times they're not but you know they're requesting them anyway so I have to look through them. And, you know, they're asking for, you know, what, the reason it's 10 million documents is they say, give me all the emails from the company that might have anything to do with this patent suit over the last 10 years, right? So, I mean, just think about how many emails you send out every day, right? You probably send out an email saying, hey, you know, what do you want to have for lunch? You don't, you don't give another minute's thought to it, yet that's stored in a server somewhere, and I'm going to have to look through it in that patent lawsuit. That's where a lot of the cost comes from. You know, it's these sorts of overbroad requests that are asking for huge volumes of huge volumes of documents that you know they're not really expecting to find anything in. They're probably not even going to look through them when I produce them. They're just hoping that the costs of having to turn over those documents and to hire lawyers to look through them is going to just run you into the ground, and you'll settle but not because of the merits of the case, but because it's too expensive for you to fight. And that's what these sorts of reforms are talking about. You know, one of the reforms is fee shifting for um, discovery, so that the party would have to um, would have to cover the costs of any documents they request um, beyond a certain you know core set of documents that everybody knows is relevant to the case. Um, and the other one is arranging the timing of discovery so that certain documents only have to be produced at a relevant time when they would actually become useful in the case and not just at the very beginning simply because they can ask for them at the beginning. Um, and these are pretty important because of the fact that, you know, producing those volumes and volumes of documents is a very expensive process. And, you know, it's a, it's a process that's easily abused, so um, reforms are really necessary to, to deal with that. Now, would you say this is another aspect of the reform provisions that you know, it needs to be reformed because plaintiffs in troll cases have a huge advantage here in terms of yeah. you know, the cost they have to put out and the work they have to put into a case. 
That's definitely right. Um, the thing is that, you know, particularly with the discovery reforms, um, this is a this is a type of abuse that either side could theoretically engage in, right? Either side could say, you know, I want this large volume of documents. I want this large volume of documents. Um, so you know, the re the reform is directed to abuses possibly on both sides, as we've seen in practice. Um, it's a lot easier to say that a document is relevant to your case if you are the plaintiff, uh, if you are the one who owns the patent, because you know if you're the if you're the person on the other side, really, what can you ask for? You can ask for documents related to the patent. Um, you can possibly ask for documents that prove ownership, but you know it's a fairly limited universe. Whereas on the other side, I can tell the company, hey, you know, I want everything that has to do with product development, about any of your products, um, about any contracts you have with other companies, um, and then you know I can go to those companies and start asking them for documents. Um, you know that side of the case very easily expands a as much as you want, and that's that's really the abusive practice that we're trying to take care of. Especially when they're facing off against non-practicing entities that don't have. Uh, you know, anything really to produce. Uh, and kind of relating to this point, uh, we discussed a little bit earlier heightened pleading standards. I know some people have some concerns about going too far with this, although I think they're looking to achieve a good balance in the Senate proposals. Um, do you have any further comments on this, or does anyone else want to talk, explain the issue a little bit? I, I can talk a little bit about that. So, so basically, um, kind of the, the background of this issue is that ordinarily in a lawsuit, um, you know, if you if somebody wants to bring a lawsuit because you know if if I don't know, if Zach injured me and I want to bring a lawsuit against Zach, right? I would have to provide to the court a document that lays out you know at least the basics of why I think Zach injured me. I can't just say Zach injured me, therefore he has to pay a million dollars. You know, that's not going to get me into court because that's unfair to Zach. Zach doesn't know what he did. Zach doesn't know how he injured me, and if I don't say it, um, it's not going to be fair for it's not going to be fair to him, um, who has to defend against this lawsuit that I'm not telling him about. It's it's Kafka's trial, right? Um, and we have Supreme Court precedent that says exactly this: you have to provide certain details in your in your complaint when you file your lawsuit. Unfortunately, what happens in patent law is that there's a loophole. Um, because there's there's basically a form called Form 18 that gives a way to get around this. The form basically says you identify a couple patent numbers, and you identify, identify the companies that, um, that supposedly are infringing your patents. That's enough to get you in court. This you know, clearly does not give the companies enough information to figure out you know, why they're infringing the patent. It could be any of their products. It could be any of the product lines. It, you know, who knows? Especially well, when you're talking with bigger tech companies that have thousands of patents. Definitely, but even smaller companies, right? If you're making a software product that maybe has that has maybe 20 features, right? The patent could be directed to any of those features. You're not going to know which one, and you know you're not going to be able to react to it. You're not going to be able to hire lawyers to figure out. Well, you're going to have to hire lawyers to figure out what they're talking about. Um, that's going to be an expensive prospect for you. That's not fair. That's not the American system. So the reforms are directed to requiring um, people who own patents who want to uh, want to assert them to at least say, you know, here's my evidence that I own this patent, here's my, here's my reasons why I think you infringed this patent, here's the products that, I, that I'm complaining about. You know, the thing is, um, I know a lot of people have been complaining that this is, that this is um, you know, overly burdensome or overly costly. The fact of the matter is that for most of the information that are requesting, this is just what you have to do as a decent lawyer in order to file a lawsuit legitimately uh, without, without, you know, the possibility of, of making a mistake or being frivolous, right? You have to do the sort of investigation. You should know what products are infringing those patents when you're asserting those patents. Otherwise, you know, you really don't have a case. So you have all that information. It's just a matter of writing it down. And all that the legislation is asking you is write it down. I think we provide a great example of that when we got our first suit and demand letter. Uh, the patent had seven claims that we had to go through. We had to have a, a lawyer read through all that and explain it to us and how we could be infringing on it. When we got farther down the uh, litigation process, it turns out it was only one claim they were actually um, going to try to uh, sue us with. But we had spent weeks and weeks looking at all seven, and that didn't come out until farther down litigation. That's a lot of extra time and a lot of extra costs. And uh, with the second demand letter we uh, received, it named three pat patents that had 63 claims between the three patents. And so now we had to hire a lawyer to go through 63 claims. And we sent back our reply and saying, well, what are you actually stating? It turns out it was just one claim on one patent. 
So the plaintiffs really use this as a way to uh, continue the asymmetry in the uh, litigation process. That they, it's actually they do it on purpose. Even if they have information, it's in their uh, favor to actually withhold it and not tell you till farther down the road because it increases your costs and time. And so I agree with Paul where this is just something in good faith that you should have to do um, when uh, making these uh, these claims. So one of the final issues that I'd like to go into before we move to questions uh, is going back to the consumer or end user protection uh, provision. Now, I, I know we talked about a lot of the trolls targeting people that are just end users and people in representing various industries uh, like apparel or like financial institutions buying kind of, you know, all kinds of different products, whether they're scanners or you know routers or or whatever, will be open to lawsuits because of the way the system is currently structured. Rather than having those lawsuits resolved with the manufacturer, uh, they say that the end users are the ones actually doing the infringing because they're the ones actually implementing the technology and using the technology. Um, now, so the, who, is, Adi, would you be up for kind of taking this one? Sure. Um, uh, you know, like you mentioned, we uh, a lot of the talk right now has been around end users and has been around um, you know protecting uh, mom and pop shops or people who are just running uh, something like Wi-Fi or an office that's running um, that has a scanner. Um, and I, I think the the protections actually need to uh, pick up when it comes to these and and the the the. Uh, most common um, proposal has been around um, customer stay provisions. Um, basically what this means is that um, uh, manufacturers can step in and uh, if you're a customer suit, um, uh, your, your suit basically gets paused until the manufacturer um, suit uh, settles or, or, or is carried through. And basically what, what happens is um, when you have an instance where uh, you know, the troll, like, for example, Innovatio that um, was targeting uh, Wi-Fi cafes. Um, uh, when they um, have a bunch of suits going on at the same time, all of a sudden they can all pause and a router manufacturer like Cisco can step in and um, settle the case or figure out the case. Um, and th that's why these sorts of uh, uh, provisions are important and it may needs to be easier for them to, uh, to happen. Yeah, to add on to that, definitely consumer stay provisions is ex extremely important to our industry, as I imagine most uh, kind of uh, consumer good industries, because we aren't, um, you know, software experts. We aren't engineers. You know, we're, we're designers and we're apparel manufacturers. And so um, being able to rely on the expertise of the you know, people that are actually making the product is very important. I will say one of the things that we we've been concerned with with some of the legislation that's been introduced um, is the concept of requiring the customer to abide by the end result of the manufacturer's lawsuit. And that's that's not something that a lot of people are, are very um, excited to see, mainly because nobody wants to have to abide by the, the results of a lawsuit that they were not party to. Um, and so it's something that and that applies not just to patent trolls, that'll apply to anything in daily life. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that we've we've been kept keeping an eye on and, and we've been pushing for um, a, a very strong uh, customer state provision. So now uh, we just have a few minutes left. I'd like to move to questions from Twitter uh, and from Google. Mm, the first question I have comes from Peter Buckingham. He asks, is there a difference between software patents and other IP patents. I can talk. Uh, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so you know, as a as a matter of just subject matter, you know, there are obviously other different types of patents. There are you know pharmaceutical patents. There are mechanical patents. There are, there are all sorts of different patents on different subject matter. Um, but I think the the bigger question is you know ought we have special rules for software patents? Um, because of the fact that they seem to be, you know, the subject of more abuses and the subject of more litigation. Um, and, to, you know, to some extent we do have that already. We have programs like the Cover Business Methods Program, which provides extra avenues for, um, for reconsidering the validity of software patents. 
Um, and I think that we have we have a number of other things that specifically deal with you know within the patent office that specifically deal with software patents as kind of the special class of particularly problematic uh, problematic things. Um, additionally, we have the uh, the Supreme Court doctrines that, um, that I think Luke mentioned, um, or maybe Eli mentioned, um, that specifically deal with um, software patents and the problems of whether or not software standing alone is patentable. Um, one of the things that that's interesting, um, you know, in that in that I like to research a lot about patents and just just look into a lot of these things is um there's a case from uh, about the 1860s of basically patent trolling over farm tools. Well, what happened was that people would get patents on very basic parts of farm tools, like on, on sliding doors or on uh, barbed wire. And they would go around and start suing all of the farmers. The farmers, of course, you know, having no experience in patent law, had no idea what to do, so they had to settle. And when you look at this, it actually sounds a lot like the software patent problems that we're having today. Instead of, instead of you know, software... Uh, instead of small software developers, we have farmers. Instead of patent trolls, we have what they call patent sharks back then. Um, and, you know, the lesson I learned from this is that, sure, you know, software patents are probably the most problematic thing right now. That's because software is the biggest thing right now. Software is the technology that really is running the world today. But who knows what's going to be the technology of tomorrow? You know, 3D printing is one that comes up a lot. Um, people have been talking with me about open hardware. You know, we have no idea what's going to be the next big technology. So, you know, we can, we can create rules that will deal with software right now. They might deal with the technology problems right now. But I think what we really need to do is take a larger look and see what are the overall abuses of the system. You know, not necessarily limited to software, but often used with software patents these days. These are things like overbroad, vague patents. These are things like litigation abuse. These are things like demand letter abuse. You know, these broad categories of ways that the system is taken advantage of. Um, and I think that is probably the best focus for patent reform if we want to really look into, you know, far into the future. No, that's great. Um, and the next question I have is from Jonathan Hainan. Uh, he asks, for anyone on the panel, what language should the Senate use to stop large companies from hoarding both legitimate and junk patents? At what point does a heap of patents become a monopoly? What is the likely outcome of the suit between Apple and Samsung? Any takers? From the just background side of it, definitely not going to go towards the, the policy answer. It is interesting, though, of this conversation right now, how we're going to try to, to make reform when there are those large companies, whether software or not, that just keep on buying up as many patents as possible. And they start trading patents with each other. There's so much money that's already been invested into it. it it's something that definitely scares me as an entrepreneur of seeing they've put too much money to, to let it just go away all of a sudden and would love to see some way to, to get around that. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I actually can't speak to the Apple-Samsung issue, but um, uh, when it comes to big companies hoarder, hoarding these uh, broad patents, um, you know, we've seen cases recently of larger companies acting, you know, troll-like. Um, we've seen issues where uh, these big companies who are actually on the forefront of the patent reform battle um, end up filing for really broad, really stupid patents. Um, so, and, and you know, their, their defense is they're just playing the game. Um, you know, they'll hit the player, play the game, uh, hit the game. And we're like, well, um, we're going to hit on the game then. Um, uh, I think this is why we need uh, patent quality provisions, really. I mean, a lot of the patents that they're filing for and that they are hoarding are really broad, stupid patents. Um, I think uh, it was uh, Julian Sanchez has a great uh, article where it says, um, you know, defensive patents are by nature bad patents. If you have a patent that is broad enough that someone else could stumble across it or could uh, potentially infringe upon it, that is a bad patent that shouldn't have been issued in the first place. And we need to crack down on these um, broad, big patents. Uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, to, to add on to what Addy said, I think um, it really is a, a symptom of the of the, the system is that they're getting the, most of these patents as a defensive measure, and that is a bad patent. They shouldn't have to go out and get these defensive patents, but you know, I'm not condoning any of them that actually use these patents to make troll-like lawsuits, 
some of them feel like they're forced to get these patents, and I'm sure they would love to not have to to pay to file for all these patents, but that most of them are getting them as a defensive measure. Now, if they're using these patents to do trolling activities, then I will not defend them. Shame on them. But if you if you create a system where they don't have to get these defensive patents, then I don't think they will. Now, that brings up an interesting point that uh, one of Adi's former colleagues has been a big proponent of, which is uh, defensive patent licensing. Adi, is that something you can just really briefly talk about? Yeah. Um, uh, actually, a couple of, of my former colleagues are now into this now. Um, uh, the idea behind defensive patent licensing or, or the defensive patent license is, uh, you know, this is bare bones, but um, you um, basically enter into an agreement with all the other companies that are part of this licensing scheme where you guys can um, uh, uh, share uh, your patents, your information with each other, but you also agree not to use your patents offensively. Um, you agree to only use your patents defensively. And there are similar schemes that um, uh, other companies have taken up, like Twitter, for example, where um, they have something called the Innovator's Patent Agreement, um, which basically says we're not going to use these patents offensively unless you, the inventor, explicitly give us or whoever we give this patent to in the future uh, permission to do so. Um, and we want to see more companies take up these sorts of uh, defensive schemes um, and really, you know, uh, not really put their money where their mouth is, mouth is but um, uh, put their actions uh, where their mouth is um, and uh, really commit these patents to only being used defensively if they are being... Um, uh, sought after for defensive purposes. I could add something there, actually, Zach. Um, I, I think that one of the reasons to have defensive patent licenses um, is that there are used. There's so many patents that are used now in standard setting organizations. So if you create a a, a web standard or or, a, or an internet standard that is is dependent on an innovation, you need to be sure that in the future that uh, no one who relies on that standard and implements it is going to be, uh, be sued for that. So a lot of times what uh, companies do is they agree to that in the context of the, of the standard um, that they won't uh, use them uh, for uh, offensive purposes. Then what's been happening lately is that companies have been transferring their patents that were them against everybody who implemented the standard. So I think it's a really important uh, area of innovation that, that companies are doing to get around the patent law, but it would be nice if they didn't have to because the law would take it into account. Final question for our panel uh, comes from Twitter. What are the chances of getting an effective bill to combat patent trolls this year? A big question. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I I think uh, <clears throat> I think we have a good potential. Uh, one, we have this panel uh, here. It's indication that we have a lot of backing. Uh, I know from a generation opportunity, our our people, we have a large grassroots effort, and a lot of people are concerned about this. And I think storming uh, storming the hill petitions. You can go to freetofuture.org. We have a petition right now. Stop patent trolls. I think the grassroots uh, side of things and showing uh, Daniel and Danny and Michael, that there are real businesses, real entrepreneurs um, that are facing these issues. I think when Congress sees that this is a reality, uh, I honestly think we can get some passed. The president has indicated that uh, he, he uh, can be swayed that way. Uh, so I think it's legitimate. We just have to get, uh, we have to get boots on the ground. Uh, and, and so I, I think there's a lot of possibility there. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's a matter of uh, when, not if. Um, I mean, it took the House 43 days to pass theirs, which in this Congress might, might as well be light speed. Um, so I, I really think that there's, there's enough momentum on the Hill. I mean, the President has the backing. There really is this broad, eclectic group of, of sometimes strange bedfellows that all side on the same side of this issue. So I really think there's enough support to make it happen. There's enough care on the Hill. I think the, the question is, it, it's the devil's in the details. You know, how long is it going to take them to um, solidify the, the, the key battlegrounds in the Senate legislation? Uh, and I don't have that answer. I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic that something will happen this year, but I don't know how long it will take.
And unfortunately, that's about all the time we have for our Hangout today. So I would like to thank all of our panelists for participating and all of our viewers for tuning in. Uh, for more information, come to our Google Plus page, our Twitter page, or our Facebook page, and we'll be posting some follow-up information. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Thanks Zach. Zach.